Hey everyone, welcome back to Work Tech. It's me, George Larock, and I've got uh, an old friend uh, and colleague to uh, share uh, some exciting news here today. Um, Jason Corsello from Acadian is with us, and Jason, I don't want to steal your thunder. Um, uh, why don't you say hello, and and we can get right into it. Hey, George. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's uh, it's great to be with you as always. Yeah. So, uh, what's what's the announcement? I'm, Folks have, many folks have seen it, but many folks probably haven't. Um, what's what's up? Yeah, so we uh, earlier this quarter we announced uh, essentially Acadian Ventures Fund Two, which is uh, our I guess sophomore fund um, of which we now have additional capital to deploy and invest in kind of the next generation of great work tech companies. Yeah, congrats on that. Um, I know that's a lot of work. Uh, a lot of uh, yes. uh, herding cats and moving parts, as they say. <laughs> uh, so, um, and what I what I love about it, um, it you know, there's there's the part uh, that is your focus and uh, you and your LPs and your team, um, the commitment to this space, but also just at, from a zooming out, um, you know. The fund was raised. There's capital to deploy in this market. Um, it's it's uh, really encouraging news, um, and I think people need to you know understand a little bit about how that how that's all happening. And so, tell us about uh, you know the fund, and uh, you know how does this fit into your overall thesis, and what are your plans? You know where what what does this next fund mean for uh, for for the market? Yeah, so I guess the headline is is you know on the fund is it's a thirty million dollar early stage fund, so we invest predominantly in seed companies, about two thirds seed, and then you know the other kind of third on the periphery of early stage pre seed, and then some uh, post seed investments. But we now have thirty million dollars, which is um, nearly three times the size of our first fund, to really deploy in the next generation of those work tech companies. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be very similar to our first fund, which is, you know, thesis wise work tech. That's all we do. That's where we specialize. It's what we know between myself and my, my partner, Thomas Otter. Um, we invest globally. So about half of our companies are outside of the U S we've invested now in companies across 13 countries. Um, and our goal is just to kind of keep doing more of the same with larger size checks, you know, taking more active roles in, in the companies that we invest in. Um, you know, we think this is a great time to be deploying capital. The last two years has been tough for all the things that, you know, you talk about and, you know, the broader markets talked about to be able to raise a fund in the last, you know, year or so has been daunting. It's been really challenging. Um, one of the great things that we announced as part of the fund is we have a, a really important strategic partner, which is ServiceNow, that came in as an LP into the fund. And, you know, we see a lot of alignment with them in, in terms of what they're doing how they're moving aggressively into the work tech um, market. And um, uh, so, you know, generally speaking, super excited and all the, you know, bigger macro trends around AI, we're, we're extremely excited about. Yeah, um, that's great. It, congratulations again. I think um, uh, that, that partnership's exciting uh, as well. And, um, you know, we're seeing, you um, you know, more and more, uh, you know, larger players in the space, you know, come in with whether it's a corporate fund or participating with you like this. Um, I, I think one of the um, one of the things that always stands out to me about Acadian is your knowledge of the market. Uh, you know, you're not an a lot of investors don't really understand work tech. That's not the case with Acadian. Um, so when I think about that, and you're going to take a more active role in your portfolio, um, you know, that's, there's a lot of operator experience there. Uh, do you want to talk about where your strengths might be or, or what that might mean for someone in your portfolio? Yeah, I'd like to, I, I say less experience and more scars, you know, between <laughs> myself and Thomas, when I was at Cornerstone for, you know, nearly eight years, Thomas was similarly at, at success factors during that time running product. Um, you know, we learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes. Um, we got to experience high growth, but you know, really, um, I think we bring a pretty comprehensive view of the market between ourselves and even some of our, you know, uh, operating partners and and LPs in the fund. 
I always like to say I'm, I'm certainly not the smartest guy, but we we have access to what we think are some of the smartest folks within the industry that were PMOs, CTOs, uh, CEOs, um, and we try to bring that to bear to our to our companies. So, you know, one of the, the things that we hear constantly when we meet with founders is, holy crap, I've never met founders that know as much about this market. Because, you know, I was on a call last week with a company talking about position management, right? Like, I'm not sure any any right. VCs in the Valley know what position management is, and probably nor should they or, or nor do they want to. But, you know, we really go deep in certain aspects of product Um and, you know, when we have those conversations, I think generally, I think, you know, hopefully founders recognize that we could be helpful, very different from, you know, more, some of the more traditional VCs that are good, but different in, you know, more generalist views of building companies and accelerating companies and scaling them. So um, we think it's it's hopefully a value add and, you know, we've gotten good feedback from our founders that, you know, they, they like us and like working with us. So, um, uh you know, that, that's where I think we we hopefully can add a lot of, of value. And, you know, we also do and occasionally in about 25% of our companies sit on the board. So we, we try to bring influence at that level as well when we need to. Great. Great. So, so you mentioned uh, what it's been like, you know, for you to raise a fund in over the last, you know, year or two, um, how, you know, it's, there's a lot of discussion constantly about how difficult it is for founders as well and and just in the market um in general the capital market um how are you seeing things how you know how the last time we checked in was probably at the um innovation summit investor forum at hr tech um i think everybody shared um the feel that i walked away thinking everybody felt like it was going to plot along as it was there was sort of like cautious optimism um, yep. the feeling that capital was going to start to get deployed, that valuations were going to creep back a little. Um, how, how's that all played out? Um, it's really interesting right now, which is, I, I mean, generally, I mean, we had our, we had a call with our LPs and, and founders yesterday. And I think the general tone is I'm optimistic and I feel like we're turning the corner on the macro, meaning, you know, investors are becoming more confident, co confident, you know, VCs want to deploy capital. Um, founders are, you know, there's a lot of, uh, at least in our pipeline, there's a lot of activity in terms of our deal flow companies that we're looking at for investment. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're turning the corner. It's still not going to happen overnight. I think, you know, 24 this year is still going to be somewhat of a get back to basics. Yeah. And I would expect by the end of this year, M&A, the market is going to, accelerate you know everyone's waiting for the ipo to market to open them back up and that's probably not going to happen until next year so there's still things that you know need to change for the market in general to get back to some feeling of okay you know things are are moving directionally where they want obviously rates you know who knows what's going to happen to rates but i think generally a lot of you know folks have baked in some form of one or two rate cuts this year which you know will will build more optimism i would expect so, I mean, generally speaking, I'm super optimistic that, you know, uh, there's more confidence, investor confidence coming back in into the markets. Obviously, the market, public markets have done, at least from a tech, tech investor per perspective, have done pretty well. But, you know, I feel I still think it still feels like it's going to be a little bit lumpy um, this year in terms of, you know, some positive signs, some negative signs. We've got this election that's coming up that, you yeah. know, who the hell you know, knows or or wants to see what what happens here. Um, so once we get through this year, I think I, you know, I think there's going to be a lot more confidence in the market. The one thing that um, still concerns me is we still haven't seen the unicorn. You know, there's a lot of talk of the death of the unicorns or the, you know, everyone's kind of got the unicorn acronym these days. Um, and um I still think there's still that reset of the companies that raise a lot of money at high valuations hasn't completely played out yet. And I would expect that will play out over the next couple of quarters. And that's going to be a necessary thing to happen to make sure this reset kind of, you know, gets to the point where we need to, where, you know, uh, more capital gets, continues to get deployed in, in the next couple of years. Yeah. I, I'm looking here because, oh yeah, it was Fortune. I've got it right down here. Their, their cover is the age of the unicorps. Which <laughs> that's right. It's just you know 
Um, I mean, it's just corn the, you know, everyone's got a, a name Zerpa for them corn. nowadays. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so <laughs> how, how are you seeing um, valuations across the market? But of course, you know, in, in your, in your world, early stage, um, yeah. I, I'm, I can tell you that I'm uh, seeing a lot of founders who, um, while they're feeling the hangover from 2021, early 2022, it hasn't really set in how, what the impact really has been on those valuations while they're raising or while they're, even if they're thinking about an exit. Um, what how, what are your thoughts on valuations that, that you can Yeah, share? I mean, generally speaking, um, you know, seed valuations are down, call it 20 to 25%, you know, from a year ago or a little over a year ago. So they're, they're down, but, you know, the seed market is still very healthy. I think what we're seeing is there's not a whole lot of change from last year and the year before. The seed market seems to be pretty steady in terms of the capital being deployed. Um, series A and Series B valuations are down you know, anywhere from 30 to 50%. Mm -hmm. I guess the difference there is, is, you know, it's really only the high quality companies that are getting funded. Um, the companies that are growing 3X, 4X, 5X, 6X in some cases, um, those are the ones that are getting funded. You know, the rest of the market, you, you got to stand out to really get funded. So yeah, um, we're going to, what we're going to see is the graduation rates of the failure rates in those companies drop off. Um, in the later stage, you know, everyone's kind of just staying away from the later stage right now. I mean, there, there are some deals that are getting funded, but on the most part, you know, probably, and the reason being is in, in geeky financial wor world, the bid ask spread is still too far, right? So what people think the value are existing investors or founders versus someone what's willing to pay, you know, for new equity, it's just too, too wide. Right. And so, and you see it in the secondary market. So there's active secondary markets where if you wanted to buy a late stage company, you know, Rippling is an example that, you know, is always, you know, being, there's always, you know, opportunities to buy or sell shares of, of Rippling shares. And, you know, from that perspective, those shares are down from their last round, you know, 30% plus or minus. So yep. um, I still think, you know, this is going to be a tough year to raise late stage capital unless you've got your fundamentals dialed in. And you almost don't need the capital, but you need it maybe, you know, as a, as a bridge to your next event, maybe it's an IPO or something else. Yeah. Um, so it, it really varies based off of, of stage. I, I think the one interesting thing, George, is a lot, you know, once you get to kind of the A stage, there's an increased focus on profitability. Right. Um, not that necessarily you need to be profitable, but you need to have kind of a, an idea or some level of path to profitability, which... Is, is relatively new. I mean, most companies didn't need to have that path to profitability until you got to the later stages. So it's being pushed much earlier in the cycle. And the reason, and I think it's a good thing because, you know, when you get to the series B, you have that optionality to say, maybe we don't need to raise capital. Or, you know, it, it just gives you some flexibility to right. kind of determine your own path right. versus being dependent on having to raise capital. Yeah. I mean, that, that, shift in uh sort of back to fundamentals um up and down right it's it's so even in the much earlier stage i was just listening to some founders a discussion the other day about um you know having to right size whereas you know two years ago found or maybe two and a half three years ago founders were you know companies were you know on their way to a seed or getting a seed and really sort of building scaling their team ahead of their business scaling. And now yep. I'm seeing much later um, uh, or companies raising at that or trying to head to that seed round with, you know, three, four people in the business and contractors and out, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different mindset um, in that sort of pre-seed to seed stage um, as well. Is that, do you see that or the, in your Absolutely. deal flow? Is that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's, um, you know, when cash was free flowing, you know, you can get away with spending, you know, more aggressively than you probably would have or should have. And and now with, you know, access to capital much more restrictive, um, you certainly have to be, be, be leaner and build leaner teams. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've got, we've got some of our, our best companies right now have really, really small teams. And I love that because, you know, um, 
you know, everyone got excited about the overnight success, but what you know typically happens in startup land is overnight successes take 10 years. <laughs> right. Right. You know, right. I look at my own experiences from, from Cornerstone. I mean, you know, Cornerstone was a 12 year, you know, journey from, from start to, uh, to public or 11 year journey to start to, to public markets. And when they went public, they had 40 million in trailing annual recurring revenue. Right. So, um, uh, you know, we're back to kind of fundamental business building, which is a good place to be, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about the trends in the market, but I, I th- this just brings up one question before I go there. Um, I, so there, there are a lot of startups who got caught in the middle on the timing here, right? Like maybe they just raised uh, before the market turned uh, or... Um, uh, you know, they were just big enough to sort of keep, you know, had enough mo- momentum to keep things going, but those fundamental metrics are challenging for them. They've got a good product. They've got a good team. Do you have any advice for, I think there are a lot of startups in that position right now who are um, trying to think about, you know, where do we focus and, you know, we can keep it on the high level, but what, you know, any advice for shops like that? It, it's so hard. I mean, my advice would have been, you know, two years ago or a year and a half ago to cut your burn by 20, 30, 40%, right? Folks that didn't take that advice from their boards to reduce their burn pretty aggressively. And, and many of them didn't, you know, they're in a very precarious position today mm-hmm. because, you know, uh, they didn't make those hard decisions a year, year and a half ago. And now they're faced with, oh crap, what do we do? Um, and either you have to cut much deeper or, or you have to do a massive down round, which no one really wants to do because it really harms both the founders and the existing shareholders. Um, or you just have to figure out how to get to profitability as fast as you can. And when you make that decision, you, you cut your growth significantly. So there's no, there's no easy or, or right answer. You know, the decisions, the tough decisions that you had to make, you should have made, you know, 18 months ago. Right. And and if you didn't, um, I think you're in a you're going to be in a really really difficult spot. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your your question or not, George. I think the um, you know the, the big challenge every company is facing, and mostly the mid to kind of later stage companies, is this kind of growth versus profitability. Right. You know, Bessemer just put out some really Bessemer Venture Partners just put out some interesting research a couple of months ago that basically said you should the, the value for growth is is significantly. Uh, more impactful versus profitability. So they're basically indicating companies should be focused on really accelerating growth again. Okay. Um, now, not every company can can do that, but there's, you know, the companies that really have that right mix of strong growth and, you know, that path to profitability, the other ones will be rewarded. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all great input. I, I, I think the, uh, you did answer the question. What I heard was if you didn't make a tough decision or make the tough decisions, um, you know, 18 months ago, uh, you're going to have, you're going to have to make even tougher decisions now. Um, and there's more risk involved in that, but, uh, it is, it is tough love. It is what it is. It's, this is where we all, this is where we are. So, um, I, I get it. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't want to throw this company under under the bus, but I was just looking at the secondary markets um, yesterday, and Checker is a is an example, right? I mean, you know, their last round valuation was at I think between five and and six billion dollars, and right. and they are trading on the on the secondary market at less than a billion in, in valuation. It's a tough spot to be, Not, and I don't know the metrics of their business. They could have a very fundamentally strong business. But it just got lopsided with with you know the valuations, and so yeah. I don't know what the right way out for for them is. But the challenge is a lot of these investors that just invested in in high growth at all costs and didn't understand the market. Right? I mean, if you look at the the I forget who it is. It's it, I think higher rates number two, and they just traded at one point five billion. Like they're a much bigger you know, more profitable company than some of the venture backed companies and they're valued at a fraction of what the last round is. So, you know, I think we got lost in a lot of investors and you know this, right. That didn't really fully appreciate or understand this market and this where, you know, specialization in, in, in my mind really, really matters is really having a grasp of, of those market dynamics that generalist yeah. investors just often don't, don't fully understand. Yeah. hundred um, percent. 
uh, and that's sort of that's where we started was sort of the value of uh, Acadian and and you and your team. So it's a it's full circle. But before I let you go, um, you do know this market, and you know you've been in it a while. You've, you're surrounded by a team that knows this market. Without you know, without revealing uh, who you're excited about in your deal flow, what are the trends you're excited about? What are the what are some of the things you're seeing that you think are uh, interesting uh, from a, a tech perspective, a product perspective right now? I mean, I'm not going to surprise you with this answer, but everything is kind of AI. You need some sort of AI story today. Um, you know, we shared yesterday, you know, 2022, about 17% of our companies had something in and around AI. Much of, many of them are more building, you know, foundational types of AI products like TechWolf is a, is a great example. Yep. Last year, it went to 82%. So from 17% to 82% companies were doing, our companies were doing something in and around AI where they had a feature, a product, or something foundational to the to the company. Um, it's closer to 90% today. Yeah. So I think if you don't have an AI story and you're out trying to fundraise, you gotta you gotta figure that out because investors all have an appetite for something AI related. Um, and we're gonna shift to see a shift in that that investment market. You know, when I look at the different kind of stacks of AI investment. Most of the investment has been happening at that kind of infrastructural, foundational sure, yeah. LLM models and the compute, at like eighty percent. And and historically, most of the capital goes to the application layer. So right. we're going to see that flip over the next couple of quarters, where it goes from infrastructure. And this is, historically, this is typically what happens in these kind of technology cycles. Most of early investment goes in the infrastructure, and then it flips to the application. We're seeing that right now with. AI is a lot of it's gone into the infrastructure and it's going to flip to go into the application layer in the next couple of years. And that's where we want to be a part of it. So easy answer, long winded, but AI is, is certainly a big trend. Um, you know, I guess I'll answer the opposite of the question is I think the trends that we're seeing that are, that are kind of, I, I'm scratching my head as this whole area of gig and freelancer, you know, we see these platform plays every day and, um, and I think Gen AI is impacting that market. Thomas was sharing some some data this morning, but that's a market that we've spent a lot of time trying to dissect and try to get an understanding of. And, and I think that's the one market that's going to be negatively impacted in in the next year from the platforms that are building the marketplaces and the SaaS models. So I can build a business as a freelancer, you know, um, uh, I'm not really bullish on that on that market right now. I answered that, the opposite of your question. Yeah, no, you you did both. Um, is that uh, is that because the work that Gen AI is going to impact, uh, the kind of knowledge work, um, is sitting on freelancer desks? Is that what you're saying? Okay, all right. I think that's one piece of it. Yeah, I think there's going to be a um, uh, probably a lot less um, demand for freelancers. Maybe that's answering the same question a different way. Um, which is counterintuitive from all of the data that we've looked at over the last five or 10 years, right? Is, you know, uh, freelancers was increasing as an option for the, for the, you know, emerging workforce. Um, so I, you know, th th this is something I, I'm not, you know, I'm sharing something more qualitative versus quantitative, meaning, you know, just a viewpoint that we have that not necessarily is supported by data today, but, you know, I do, I, I do struggle with the whole gig and freelance marketplace right now and understanding how that evolves in the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, based yeah. off of the impact of, of what we're seeing on the AI side. Yeah. That's interesting. I, um, I think I've been, I've been thinking about that issue holistically as it relates across the workforce. Uh, but to your point, um, you know, content generation, marketing, uh, even, now getting into you know working with data working with spreadsheets you know calculations etc um any of that work you could have a resource internally with the right ai and far fewer you might still have freelancers but far fewer who are really good with a supporting you with ai um that, i think that's interesting um well I'll, we'll have to check back on that next time see yeah. how, that, how that plays out um, I, I, I know we're at time and, um, as always, I could pick your brain for, you know, hours, but, um, I, uh, I want to be sensitive to your time and also, uh, bring you back. Uh, so 
Uh, thank you so much, Jason. Congratulations again on the fund. I'm excited uh, and looking forward to seeing where you go with it. And um, uh, thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks, George, as always. It's great to see you and um, looking forward to seeing you on the road here soon. Yeah, yeah, we definitely will definitely be bumping into each other. And thanks, everyone, if you're watching or listening. And um, until next time.